comparable studies and really apply to uh, catalytic reactions. And likewise, in, in the oral presentations, we, I notice we no longer have a standalone uh, session for surface science, and I think that's good news. I think it's well integrated into our field. For many years, those of us who've, who've practiced this uh, have heard the criticism that if you can see it, it's dead, and it's not a, a, an active intermediate in catalysis. And there are certainly examples where that's true, but I think in general that's not true. Uh, that there, there are too many examples in literature now where uh, we've identified intermediates in reactions like oxidations, hydrogenations, and dehydrogenations, dehydrations, carbon-carbon bond formations, where we really can go in and see uh, intermediates, even under UHV conditions, uh, that are those that are important in catalytic reactions. So I think just because you can see a species doesn't mean that it, it's not an active intermediate. And moreover, as the power of both experimental techniques and theory continues to increase, I think we have the possibility of, of seeing even more things, shorter lived, less stable intermediates. So the, the question that I would like to, to ask this morning, and one that I hope that you'll carry with you in your own research, is whether or not there are new intermediates out there waiting to be discovered and if there are, presumably we're all clever enough to figure out new things to do with them, new surface chemistry and new catalysis. Now, I'm not going to suggest that this is the only way to invent catalysis, but I would suggest that most of us wouldn't be here if we didn't think there were new things to be discovered. Uh, my particular angle is to, to look at surface intermediates. And uh, in particular, I think it, it again, illustrates or will illustrate as I go on this morning, uh, the importance of combining theory and experiment in this pursuit. So let's delve into the specific example. That's the epoxidation of olefin with silver catalysts. Uh, the classic example is ethylene epoxidation to ethylene oxide, uh, carried out commercially for about half a century over silver catalyst supported on alpha alumina. And this is uh, an example that involves a direct oxidation, so no peroxide uh, species there. Um, and up until the last few years, this was essentially the only example of, of its type. Silver was a unique, unique catalyst for doing this, it still is, and ethylene is about the only olefin that could be epoxidized. Uh, essentially commercially, or to commercial yields and selectivities. Uh, in recent years, Eastman has commercialized the process at the bottom, which is the epoxidation of butadiene to epoxy butene, or a molecule we will refer to as EPB. The catalyst for this is, is similar, the promoter package is similar, although not exactly the same. Um, one of the limitations to broadening this chemistry is the fact that uh, olefins with allylic hydrogens tend to undergo CH bond scission and combust. Uh, it's not an absolute prohibition against epoxidizing uh, olefins that contain allylic hydrogens, but it's certainly one of the hurdles that uh, people continue to address. So what do we know about this catalysis? Well, I think uh, there's a lot known uh, as a result of, among other things, surface science studies over the last two decades about the state of oxygen on the catalyst, thanks to uh, Rutger Van Santen and, and Richard Lambert and Charlie Campbell and others, uh, I think it's pretty clear now that the active oxygen species is an atomic oxygen uh, and that considerable amounts of subsurface oxygen in the catalyst are required. But what about the organic chemistry side of the picture? Uh, we don't know much about what happens between the left-hand side of that arrow and the right-hand side. Uh, if you think about the reaction that one's trying to accomplish, it involves the formation of two carbon-oxygen bonds. And so a simple question, are those formed sequentially or in concerted fashion? That's, that's a question that I think still hasn't been answered definitively uh, in 2001, again, after more than 50 years of commercial practice of that reaction. I'll come back to that in a minute. Another way to frame the same question is, are there identifiable organic intermediates along the way that we might use to, uh, to answer. And there are just a handful of examples in the literature where people have suggested that there are indeed stable organic species 
in olefin epoxidation catalysis. Uh, it was a paper uh, from Alex Bell's group more than 25 years ago, uh, carrying out infrared spectroscopy uh, on supported silver catalysts, both looking at ethylene oxide absorption and ethylene epoxidation. And they suggested that ethylene oxide, in fact, ring opened on the catalyst uh, to make some species that they could fingerprint the spectrum of, but didn't really have a, a, a good uh, handle on the interpretation of. They suggested that it might be a radical uh, of the, the sort that I've illustrated on this figure. And in the intervening decades, there really have not been many other examples uh, of stable intermediates in this catalysis. Uh, Richard Lambert's group, uh, about a decade after Bell, doing some surface science studies, suggested that the organic intermediate on the surface was already the product ethylene oxide, uh, and that it desorbed a little bit above room temperature, or reacted there. Uh, but that was based strictly on TPD studies, and there was no spectroscopic evidence for that species. Uh, looking at the ethylene, or excuse me, the butadiene epoxidation reaction, John Monnier uh, and his co-workers at Eastman suggested that the epoxy butene product was strongly bound to the silver catalyst in that example, uh, and in fact sufficiently strongly bound that it inhibited uh, the butadiene epoxidation that they were trying to accomplish. So there are a few hints over the last two or three decades that there might be some stable organics. Uh, on the surface, stable intermediates that we might try to identify in the course of olefin epoxidation catalysis. Uh, but really very limited uh, evidence, both spectroscopic and otherwise, for the existence of such species. The hypothesis behind our work is that the addition of oxygen to olefins and olefin epoxidation is a sequential process and it does proceed through intermediates on the surface, and those intermediates are oxymetallocycles. And I've illustrated a schematic structure of an oxymetallocycle. So it's a metallocycle because it's a cyclic structure on the surface incorporating metal atoms. The, the line at the bottom is meant to, to represent the metal surface and will be mysterious for a while about just how many metal atoms uh, are coordinated there. It's an oxymetallocycle because we have oxygen incorporated in the ring. Um, and just as an aside, making structures like this on surfaces is considerably more challenging than making uh, structures where we have the same chemical function bound to the surface at both ends of the, the cycle. Here we have unlike functions, and, and as you'll see, there's some challenges in even creating these kinds of structures. Now, I've put a hypothesis up here, and the usual way that we teach our students to give talks is to tell the audience what you're going to tell them and then tell them and then remind them what you told them. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell you whether or not this hypothesis is valid. Uh, right now you're going to have to wait till the end. So think of this more like a detective story. Uh, there are going to be lots of twists and turns and, and dead ends along the way. Uh, I'm not going to jump to the, to the end of the book and read you the final page of the detective story. Because, in fact, it's not written yet. Uh, I think there's still some things uh, to be discovered here. But I hope in the process of going through this detective story that we'll pick up some ideas that really uh, we can apply to a, a much larger category of problems in, in surface science and catalysis than this one. Back to these oxymetallocycles, we didn't quite pull them out of thin air. Uh, there were some precedents for these ideas. And let me show you those. Let me start in the middle here. If you go to the organometallic literature, you will find uh, a variety of reactions in which people have observed or hypothesized these metallo-oxetane intermediates. And I've shown two examples there. Uh, one of the sort that uh, has been made on rhodium, iridium, ruthenium. Uh, complexes. Again, these are all mononuclear metal complexes, single metal atoms involved. Uh, Barry Sharpless has also invoked this kind of structure in the asymmetric dihydroxylation of olefins by osmium catalysts, although the intermediacy of this has been disputed. Uh, as in the heterogeneous catalysis literature, 
There are many more examples where these kinds of structures are hypothesized than uh, examples where they're actually isolated and identified. But there are uh, isolated and identified examples in the homogeneous catalysis literature. Uh, some other work by John Margrave and Rice a number of years ago looked at insertion of metal atoms into a carbon-oxygen bond of, of uh, ethylene oxide to make this kind of metallo-oxetane structure, and then he isolated and characterized those spectroscopically uh, in matrix isolation experiments. These kinds of, of structures had been proposed on surfaces uh, by our group and others, uh, and I'll show you some examples of that in a moment, but prior to about five years ago, they had never actually been made. So we really didn't know whether or not they were figments of our imagination. These are some of the examples from the surface science literature where these kinds of structures have been proposed. Uh, and examples include some of Cindy Friend's work uh, looking at the oxidation of propylene to acetone on oxidized rhodium surfaces. Uh, Bob Maddox some years ago suggested that such structures could be intermediates in the reaction of tertiary butanol to uh, isobutylene oxide on oxidized silver surfaces. Uh, our group had invoked them as intermediates in ring opening reactions of epoxides on rhodium and palladium and also in the dehydrogenation and decarbonylation of primary alcohols on rhodium. But in none of these examples had this character in the middle, the oxymetallocycle actually been observed. So this is all based on circumstantial evidence and sort of figuring out what bonds you would have to make and break to get between the reactants and products in all of these cases. So we set out um, in the, the mid-90s to actually try to synthesize these kinds of structures on a surface so that we could test whether or not they were intermediates in these kinds of reactions as well as in olefin epoxidation. And as I said, one of the things that I want to illustrate for you this morning is the close connection between theory and experiment in these studies. And so we're actually going to be moving back and forth between them, I hope fairly seamlessly. But let me begin by introducing the, uh, the techniques on both sides uh, that we've used. On the experimental side, uh, I'll show you results from three different techniques. Temperature program desorption to look at reaction pathways and kinetics a high-resolution electron energy loss spectroscopy to get vibrational spectra of surface intermediates, and near-edge X-ray absorption fine structure, NEXAPS, to get at the electronic structure of adsorbates. So those are all fairly straightforward. On the theory side, our principal, our, our principal tool has been density functional theory. And there's a lot of information on here that I won't go through. Um, the main points are as follows. We're using finite clusters, anywhere from one to perhaps 15 or more uh, metal atoms to represent a metal particle or a metal surface. The code that we've used is the Amsterdam Density Functional, or ADF, code, and with all of the usual disclaimers below that that uh, I won't go into. Now, we're going to be using this in a variety of ways to try to calculate stable structures of these proposed intermediates to calculate their thermochemical properties, to calculate reaction trajectories and transition states, to calculate vibrational spectra, to calculate electronic spectra. So that there's a lot uh, that we can do to extract information from our calculations that we can benchmark against actual experimental observations. I want to start by looking simply at the, the thermochemistry side of it. One of the things we want to do is see whether or not these kinds of intermediates are even reasonable to think about. Or are they thermodynamically so far out that you know, they, they can't be stable structures? If that were the case, I wouldn't be giving this talk. But, but anyway, let me make the case for you. So I'm going to be showing you energetics for the reaction that I've illustrated here. It basically involves the insertion of metals into the ring of, in this case, ethylene oxide. So we're going to be looking at the heat of reaction going from right to left there whether or not the insertion of metal atoms, one or two in these cases, into the ring makes a species which is thermodynamically more favorable than the reactants. So the more negative the heat of reaction there in going from right to left, the more thermodynamically uh, stable, more thermodynamically favorable the oxymetallocycle is. Now we've actually uh, looked at 
a wide variety of metals across the periodic table, and so I won't go into that. Uh, I want to focus on the, the coinage metals this morning, primarily silver with a little bit of copper. Now, when you use finite clusters to represent surfaces, you know, that, that immediately draws criticism. One or two metal atoms can't possibly represent an extended zero-valent metal surface. Maybe it can, maybe it can't. So one of the things that we wanted to do is to try to figure out how large uh, a cluster of metal atoms one needs to adequately represent a surface for the purposes at hand. How big does it need to be to actually begin to extract useful information? And while I will show you data for larger clusters, which are computationally uh, more demanding, and therefore we want to, to avoid whenever we can, uh, I want to make the case to you that in, in much of the work that I'll show you, one or two metal atoms are sufficient to begin to get very useful information out of the calculations. So let me show you just a, a simple bit of, of uh, our calculations to try to make this case. We're computing here these heats of reaction. You can think of them as heats of formation, but again, they're relative to the, to the olefin in the metal cluster. Um, for this oxymetallocycle structure, and we're inserting two metal atoms into the ring, and in the case where we go to a larger cluster, then the additional metal atoms are decorating uh, the outside of this or underneath it. We're not forcing that ligand to span 15 metal atoms. So what do we find? On silver, we find that the insertion of, of two metal atoms is, is thermodynamically favorable by a order 10 kilocalories per mole. We just consider two metal atoms. As we go up in cluster size, you see that the uh, heat of reaction varies a little bit. It gets as high as about 14 or 15 kcals per mole, and then you start to see a little oscillation with cluster size as you go beyond that. Now, 4 kcals may seem like a big error. I'm going to argue it's not. That, act, that actually is, is usefully bounds the problem, uh, and that this structure is going to, to uh, represent something we can actually make on the surface. I'll make that argument for another reason. Look at the right-hand column in this table for copper. You see, if we make the same structure on copper, it's favorable by about 30 kilocalories per mole. So we're never going to mistake silver for copper just because we have an inadequate number of metal atoms in our cluster. Uh, and so I would argue that even one or two may convey many of the appropriate properties of a silver surface. You should be skeptical at this point. I hope by the end of this morning's talk you'll be a little less skeptical and accepting the subject. Back to experiments. Right? People have suggested that these species exist on surfaces, but nobody's made one. How do you make one? Well, after a variety of false starts, we decided to, to try this reactant, iodoethanol. And the idea is that the carbon iodine bond here has a bond energy of about uh, 50 kilocalories per mole. And it's known that alkyl iodides absorb dissociatively at low temperature on silver, to make alkyl groups. So we're just think of this as an alkyl group with a hydroxyl on the end. So the idea is to use the iodine to activate the back end of the molecule and hope that at some point in the process we can activate the oxygen-hydrogen bond, perhaps by uh, oxidation if need be, although as I'll show you that turns out not to be necessary, uh, to, to tack down both ends of the structure on the surface and make this proposed oxymetallocyte. And I will tell you our bias going into this was that even though all of the uh, organometallic examples involved a single metal atom, that on an extended metal surface, why would you choose to make the more uh, uh, strained ring with essentially four members in a single metal atom rather than a five-membered ring where this would span several metals on the surface? And we're going to see some examples of both of those structures this morning. So let me show you the experimental results. Iodoethanol on silver reacts pretty cleanly. Uh, this is a temperature program desorption experiment on a silver 110 surface in ultra high vacuum. So we absorb iodoethanol at 100 Kelvin or thereabouts um, and uh, look at what comes off as we ramp the temperature. And the first thing is that the excess iodoethanol desorbs. And then we see a series of products coming off below room temperature 
that are basically C2 species, acid aldehyde, ethylene, and, and ethanol. And there's another state that reacts above room temperature and gives rise to the same product slate plus a new product which I've labeled GBL. And I'll identify that for you in a moment. So our interpretation of these kinds of results is as follows. The iodoethanol breaks the carbon iodine bond at low temperature and forms this hydroxyethyl intermediate on the surface. That's the species that reacts below, below room temperature and undergoes various dehydrogenations and hydrogenations to make these C2 products. But one of the other things it makes, we hypothesize, is the oxymetallocycle here. And that reacts above room temperature to make C2 oxygenates, but most of the carbon, uh, or at least a plurality of it, comes off in the form of this product, gamma butyrolactone. That's the GBL. So we are making a cyclic oxygenate, but it's a five-membered ring. It results from the dimerization of uh, our reactant or our intermediate, rather than the unimolecular ring closure to make an epoxide. So we think we've made this oxymetallocycle. The bad news is it didn't make ethylene oxide. We'll come back to that. OK, well, that's a nice scheme. Does it have any basis in reality? We can take high resolution electron energy loss spectra of this intermediate that we hypothesized to be the oxymetallocycle. And the experimental spectrum is shown in the upper uh, curve on this plot. And the problem is that since nobody's ever seen one of these structures before, how do you know what the spectrum is telling you? Well, that's where theory has an important role to play. We can calculate certainly the safe, stable structure for an oxymetallocycle. We can calculate its summer chemical properties. We can calculate its vibrational spectrum. And shown at the bottom is the calculated vibrational spectrum for the structure shown at the top. And it, it's an excellent match. Moreover, we can animate the vibrations of this molecule on the computer, and that allows us to actually go in and assign the modes, because again, there aren't obvious precedents, obvious models that we can use to do that. As you can see here, the most intense modes are asymmetric deformations of the oxygen-carbon-carbon background bone of this molecule on the surface. Uh, I have to admit, as kind of a, a hardcore experimentalist, when we started getting results like this out of theory, I was surprised, and it took me a while uh, to accept just uh, how much impact it could, could have on our research. Uh, so I've become a believer, and I hope that some of that will, will uh, be transmitted this morning. Um, we can look at larger clusters if you're uncomfortable about two metal atoms representing the surface, and we've gone to as big as 12 metal atoms, and it has basically no effect on the calculated vibrational spectrum. In contrast, even with, with two metal atoms, that's enough to tell us something about the configuration of this species on the surface. For example, we can ask about the alternative structure that incorporates a single metal atom, and that's also thermodynamically stable, not quite as stable as the one with two metal atoms, according to theory, but you can see the match between experiment and theory is rather poor. So even looking at only one or two metal atoms to represent the surface, we can tell whether or not the species that we've made experimentally is uh, coordinated to one or two metal atoms in reality. So here's another version of the reaction scheme. We've actually been able to make and spectroscopically identify both the hydroxyethyl and the oxymetallocycle. But we have the problem over here that we don't see ethylene oxide. So we've shown that oxymetallocycles exist. We haven't shown that they're intermediates in epoxidation. Now, there are a variety of possible reasons that that might be. One that occurred to us was that, well, perhaps uh, this is a structure-sensitive reaction, and we need to change the crystallographic structure of the surface. And then maybe ethylene oxide will show up. And so we looked at the 111 surface. Uh, Eddie Tyso at Wisconsin-Milwaukee has done the same, and we both find that not only do we not make ethylene oxide on the 111 surface, 
on that surface you make much less gamma butyrolactone. So the one reaction that is structure sensitive is this dimerization to make the lactone. I'll just show you very quickly that the intermediate on silver 111 is also an oxymetallocycle. Just qualitatively, you can compare the vibrational spectra after iodoethanol absorption on silver 110 and 111. You can see there's some differences in the intensities uh, of uh, some of the vibrations because the, the uh, uh, sort of uh, flexing of the backbone of the molecule coordination of the metal surface is a little different. But basically, in both cases, we have this oxymetallocycle coordinated to two metal atoms on the surface. And in fact, we can go in and use a cluster that represents the 111 surface and, again, get very good agreement between the experimental spectrum obtained on that surface and the calculated vibrational spectrum on that surface. So we make the oxymetallocycle on both of these low-index surfaces of silver from iodoethanol but it doesn't make ethylene oxide. So this is still an, an aggravation. In fact, I, I gave some of the preliminary results that I've shown you this morning a, a few years ago at a uh, conference, and a, a well-known organometallic chemist got up and said, look, you know, you proposed that this was the intermediate in, in olefin epoxidation. You made the intermediate. It doesn't make the product you propose. You know, you're wrong, you lose, give up. Uh, and fortunately, we had at least one year of funding left on the grant, so we decided to give up. Uh, but we decided to come at this from a different angle. And that angle was really inspired by uh, the work that uh, has come out of Eastman Chemical, looking at butadiene epoxidation. So again, just to, to review this, um, it's a, a alkali and halide promoted silver on alpha alumina catalyst. The difference here, and this is going to turn out to be important between butadiene and, and ethylene epoxidation, is that the epoxy butene, or whatever uh, intermediate is made, is very strongly bound to the surface. And so we saw that and said, maybe this is a better thing to, to chase. It'll be a little easier if we can make it to, to work with. It'll last longer. Uh, let's take a crack at this one. Uh, I should point out that this is a relatively unusual example in catalysis where the, the effect of promotion is to increase both activity and selectivity. Usually there's a trade-off. And the reason is, again, because of this strongly bound intermediate or product, uh, the promoters tend to decrease the interaction of, of that species, whatever it is, and I'll show you what it is in a moment, uh, with the surface, so the rate goes up, but also, it's not on the surface as long to decompose or get oxidized or whatever, and the selectivity also goes up. And in fact, what, what the Eastman folks have reported is that the promoters decrease the activation barrier for that reaction by 14 or 15 kilocalories per mole. But you can see those barriers are still substantial ones, and we should expect in either of those cases for the uh, intermediate to exist well above room temperature. So we decided to, to have a look at epoxy butene in our uh, surface science experiments. Um, and this shows you the, the temperature program desorption spectrum of epoxy butene on silver 110. If we adsorb it at, at low temperatures, uh, it just comes back off in molecular form. If we adsorb it at room temperature, however, we were able to populate this high temperature uh, state on the surface. And so it basically says that the population of this state is an activated process. In fact, we measure that activation barrier to be about 8.5 kilocalories per mole. You can see that when whatever it is on there reacts, it not only reforms the original reactant epoxy butene, but we also see uh, an isomer 2,5-dihydrofuran. So again, this suggests to us that what we formed on the surface is in fact ring open and it leaves the surface by ring closure reactions either to form a, a three-membered epoxide ring or a five-membered uh, furanic ring. And so our hypothesis is that this is an oxymetallocycle. Now the problem is when you go to bigger molecules, uh, you have a lot more choices, a lot more isomers. And we've considered these four potential intermediate structures, 
You notice in this case, the density functional theory says the one in the lower left is thermodynamically preferred, but they're all close enough that nature might choose to make any or all of them. And so what we need to do is to go through and calculate the spectra for each of those and compare that against the experiment. And based on our iodoethanol work, we thought we'd try the ones bridging two metal atoms first. So it, this quickly becomes an exercise in pattern matching. Here you see the compared experimental and theoretical spectra, experimental spectrum for this stable intermediate drive from epoxy butene on silver and the calculated spectrum below. And you can see that uh, for this isomer where we've opened the ring such that the oxygen now is on the end of the hydrocarbon chain, we get the most intense mode in the vibrational spectrum correct. It's basically the vinyl group uh, moving back and forth off the surface. But the agreement of the rest of the spectrum is not of the quality that I showed you before. So we'll keep going. It's good enough to tell us that this isomer, where the oxygen comes off of the inter one of the interior carbons of the chain, isn't the answer. And you can see that, that the agreement for this structure is really quite poor. So it looks like we should put the oxygen on the end of the chain. What happens now as we change the number of metal atoms? Things start to, to shape up. So here's the spectrum with a single metal atom in the ring, a four-membered oximetallocycle ring. And you see that the agreement of, of most of the modes above about 800 wave numbers is, is excellent. Um, but we've got a problem down here. There's a pretty intense mode that we observe experimentally, about 400 wave numbers. And, and the theory says it should be about 600. Now, if you think about it, back to, to the question I raised at the beginning, is one metal atom an adequate representation of a surface? And most people would say no, because you can't get the electronic structure of the metal atom, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. There's a bigger problem here, and that is because we have this large organic ligand, it may choose to interact at more points on an extended metal surface than this model permits. And in fact, that's the issue here. The vinyl group out here is quite reactive, and we haven't given it anything to bind to. If we provide it with some additional metal atoms to interact with, it does. And now this is essentially our answer to the structure of that stable intermediate on the, the silver 110 surface. And now we get that low frequency mode right and good agreement with the rest of the spectrum. We see a, a pretty, uh, although we haven't drawn in the bond here, there is a bond to the, the terminal carbon. And that interaction adds an additional 10 kilocalories per mole to the heat of formation of, of this species. So we've got spectroscopic conformation here. Uh, I want to very quickly show you results from a second spectroscopy. That's near-edge X-ray absorption fine structure. And basically what it does is to look at excitation of electrons from the core levels into the antibonding orbitals. So you get a map of the energies of the antibonding orbitals. This is done on the synchrotron at, at Brookhaven. And what we're going to be taking advantage of is the selection rule here. Basically, if we look at, at orbitals where the lobes are perpendicular to the surface, like a, a, a pi bond parallel to the surface, if we bring in the light uh, normal to the surface, we don't get a transition. Uh, if we bring in the light so it can see essentially both lobes of the orbital, then we do get a transition. So by looking at the, the next half spectrum as a function of the angle of the incident radiation, we can learn something about molecular orientation <coughs> structure. So here's the next half spectrum for that stable intermediate from epoxy butene. And what you see here are two features that are strongly dependent on the angle of incidence of the radiation, one at 285.4, one at 292.4, that show up when the radiation comes in at glancing angle, but not when it comes in normal to the surface. Well, what are those? Uh, the one at 285 is pretty clearly a pi star carbon-carbon uh, antibonding orbital. Um, and we can calculate what that orbital is for this species from density functional theory. And you can see that the lobes of the p orbital is essentially normal to the surface. And so when we bring in the radiation like this, we're going to, to see those. And so that's the 285.4 EV mode. We want to look for another orbital that 
also should give us angular dependent transitions in next apps. And DFT says that the next one up is this one, which is the uh, CO antibonding orbital here. And again, you see essentially that the lobes of this orbital normal to the surface. DFT says that that should be 7 volts higher in energy than the LUMO. And lo and behold, that's exactly where we see it in experiment. So we now have essentially two spectroscopies identifying the structure and interpreting in terms of the theory. We can also look at, at reaction energetics and kinetics. Here's the, the reaction coordinate. Uh, what we've observed experimentally is an activation barrier to uh, ring open epoxy butene of about 8 kilocalories per mole from TPD. The activation barrier going in the other direction is 32. So an overall heat of reaction of 24 kilocalories per mole would calculate that to be about 27 or 28, depending on the size of the cluster. So again, I think reasonable agreement there. Uh, I would note that in the promoted industrial catalyst, the activation energy is observed to be 26.4, which suggests that what the promoters are doing in part is shaving down this barrier, and you can't get this much below the actual heat of reaction. We can do even better than that. We can actually calculate the transition state for closing the ring, and that's shown here on the right. It basically involves a motion of the hydrocarbon backbone over the top of the oxygen. It's sort of like sitting on the front edge of a folding chair and having it fold up underneath you. Um, but what we calculate is an activation barrier for that reaction of 31 kilocalories per mole. We measure it experimentally to be 32 kilocalories per mole. I think we're well within the resolution of, of both of those techniques. And I think we pretty well have this intermediate nailed down as the stable intermediate uh, form from epoxy butene. That's all surface science. Can we connect it to catalysis? In collaboration with John Monnier at, at Eastman, we've looked at uh, kinetic isotope effect uh, measurements doing steady state butadiene epoxidation on promoted and unpromoted silver catalysts to try to see where this oxymetallocycle intermediate fits into the scheme. And we've done both deuterium labeling studies and O18 labeling studies and looked at the, the changes in rate. Let me show you some of those results. This is a busy slide. Um, here you see on the unpromoted catalyst, the selectivity to epoxy butene is only about 26%, and most of the reactant gets combusted. Now over here are the ratios of the rates for unlabeled versus deuterium labeled uh, butadiene. And so we've got RH over RD. And recall that most of the time when you label with deuterium, right, the rate slows down if you have a, a, the usual isotope effect. <coughs> so that that number should be bigger than one. And certainly that's what we see for the combustion reaction marginally. But what we have for the selective oxidation reaction to either butadiene or furan is an inverse kinetic isotope effect. We see an overall uh, increase in the rate of reaction when we deuterate, especially at, at the terminal carbons of this molecule. Here's the, uh, the Cliff's Notes version of, of that overhead. And again, uh, when we deuterate, the rate of the selective oxidation reaction goes up, and the rate of the unselective combustion goes down. That kind of behavior had been observed many years ago. Uh, in ethylene epoxidation by uh, Noel Kant and Keith Hall, and others have seen it since then. And they interpreted it in terms of a common reaction intermediate, which wasn't identified in ethylene oxidation. What you're doing by deuterium labeling is to decrease the rate of the combustion reaction in the usual way. The effect of that is to increase the pool, the concentration of the common intermediate on the surface, and thereby increase the rate of reaction to the desired product. So the, the inverse kinetic isotope effect arises not because you're tweaking the rate constant, but because you're changing the concentration of intermediates on the surface. Well, in the case of epoxy butene, we know what that intermediate is. It's the oxymetallocycle that we've demonstrated spectroscopically on the surface. And we can put together a similar reaction network uh, for this case that Qualitatively, it's the same idea, 
that when we deuterium label, we discriminate against the combustion reaction, increase the pool of our oxymetallocycles on the surface, and increase then the rate at which species in that pool go to the desired product. Now the difference here is that, of course, what we found is that K1, the removal of the oxymetallocycles, got a big barrier, and K minus one has a small one. So there's a much larger equilibrium constant for formation of this intermediate in the butadiene epoxidation case than in the ethylene epoxidation case. Now, if this argument is correct, it says that if we don't have, if we have a selective catalyst, we're not going to see much effect of isotopic labeling. And in fact, one can do that. This is now for a promoted catalyst where the selectivities to epoxybutene are quite high already. And did I lose the mic? remaining, I'd like to come back to the problem of, of ethylene oxidation. This, this is a, a, a nagging one. 
And I'll show you some of the structures then that we've calculated for these oxymetallocycles that might be expected to ring close to ethylene oxide. So you see at the top, the one that bridges two metal atoms. We've made that experimentally for myotoethanol. Experimentally, it doesn't close to make ethylene oxide. Well, okay, maybe we just haven't done the right experiment. But we've also searched theoretically. We can search for a transition state for the ring closure reaction of that ethylene oxide. We've been trying to find one for several years, and we can't find one. So we decided, well, gee, experiment is telling us that that doesn't make ethylene oxide. Theory is telling us it doesn't make ethylene oxide. Maybe it doesn't make ethylene oxide. Well, in, in the epoxy butene case, we have a different structure that does close to make an epoxide ring. And that's one in which we have only a single metal atom in the oxymetallocycle. And if we start with that structure on the surface, which theory says is almost as stable as the one on the top of this figure, um, we do find a transition state, and that's illustrated here. And so we can calculate a reaction coordinate for that reaction. And it's shown here. It suggests that the ring closure reaction of that intermediate with a single metal atom in it is uh, act, uh, as an activation barrier of about 15 kilocalories per mole. Further, it says that the ring closure reaction is uphill by about 5 kcals per mole. So going in the other direction, there's an activation barrier of perhaps 10 kilocalories to ring opening ethylene oxide to make the species on the surface. Now that says that there may be a narrow window of temperature in which we could actually do this reaction. To pick the temperature just high enough to get over a 10 kilocalorie barrier, but not high enough to get back over the 15 kilocalorie barrier. And indeed, you can do that. So here's the analogous experiment to the one that we did with epoxy butene. If we put ethylene oxide on the surface at low temperature, basically it comes back off at low temperature. But if we pick a temperature in the range of about 200 to 250 Kelvin, we can populate a state that stays on the surface above room temperature. In temperature program desorption experiments, that comes off primarily as ethylene oxide with small amounts of other C2 products, ethylene, ethanol, probably a little acid aldehyde. So that suggests, once again, that we have a ring-opened intermediate on the surface and that its main reaction channel is, is the ring closure. Well, we've now got a state that makes ethylene oxide in a surface science experiment. What is it? Well, we can take its vibrational spectrum. And that's shown at the top. We have two, really only two modes that show up very clearly, one at 850 and one at 1090 wave numbers. We know it's not ethylene oxide itself. The two lower spectra at 110K are for a multi-layer of ethylene oxide on the surface, and at 140K for molecularly adsorbed ethylene oxide. So it's not ethylene oxide. What is it? You also see it's not the metallocycle that we got from iodoethanol. It's a different structure. This is kind of a, a busy table. Let me lead you through it. Here's what we've made at the top. From iodoethanol, we can make that five-membered ring. We've got the experimental spectrum. We've got the theoretical spectrum. They match. We can ring open ethylene oxide to something that we suspect is the four-membered ring. The experimental spectrum is shown there. And if we just include one metal atom in the ring, we get vibrational modes that are in the ballpark. Certainly the, the lower ones, lower entries in each of those uh, uh, rows match reasonably well with the experiment. The quality of agreement with a single metal atom isn't quite what, what we would like. But it's clearly something different that we make from ethylene oxide than we made from iodoethyl. One of the one of the uh, issues, I think, is that all of the species that I've shown you to this point are not, don't have a high degree of symmetry on the surface, and so we see all the vibrational modes. Turns out that this intermediate from ring opening ethylene oxide is nearly planar. It has CS symmetry, or almost CS symmetry, a mirror plane, and so we see very few modes. 
So the, the, the lack of modes is actually telling us something about the symmetry in the structure. I'll, I'll go on to, to show you our best agreement to date, but I wanted to pull back and, and look at what we find in the catalysis literature. Alex Bell's paper of 25 years ago, the intermediate that he observed on a supported silver catalyst, and look at those two modes down there, 1080 and 860, they're within 10 wave numbers each of the species that we make by ring opening uh, ethylene oxide on a silver single crystal in ultra high vacuum. So after 25 years, surface science has finally figured out how to make that intermediate. Uh, what is it? Well, maybe it's this. We don't think it's the radical structure. We've done calculations for those and we can't get very good agreement at all. Our best agreement so far <clears throat> comes from this structure. Here you see this intermediate basically with a single metal atom incorporated into the ring. The oxygen may be multiply coordinated to the surface. You see from the on top view that it's just barely distorted from planar. So we have very nearly CS symmetry. And so I think that turns out to give us lots of modes that, that don't show up in our vibrational spectrum. What I've shown you at the left here is our current best agreement between calculated and experimental vibrational spectra for this intermediate. The, the 850 or 860 mode is pretty clearly a ring deformation. and Almost anything we do to the structure gives us that mode. The one at, at 1060 or 1090 thereabouts is a little bit trickier. Uh, we interpret that as CH2 bends. Now it turns out, again, because of the symmetry of the species and because the surface dipole selection rule, which is not taken into account in the density functional theory calculations, that some of these modes aren't going to be dipole allowed on the surface. For example, the wag of the hydrogens on that middle carbon parallel to the surface will be dipole forbidden because of surface dipole screen. And that's actually, for the cluster, what theory says is the most intense. So what we think is that it's this small mode at, at 1090, which is basically the wag of the hydrogens on the terminal carbon away from the surface, which should be amplified by the surface dipole selection rule, which is, in fact, what gives rise to that peak. I wish the agreement were better. We're still tuning it up. But I think we've got a pretty good idea of what that species is on the surface. So I think there are two key points to be made from this reaction coordinate. One is that for the first time, we have made a stable intermediate on a silver surface in a surface science experiment that ring closes to make ethylene oxide. And I think the other important message is the role of theory in this, because it was theory that basically told us where to look, what temperature window in which we might actually hope to form this by ring opening ethylene oxide. This morning, I have shown you examples of three stable oxymetallocycler intermediates on silver that do a variety of different chemistries. I think you're going to see that the uh, members of this menagerie increase dramatically in the future. For example, there are already beginning to arise examples on, on other metals. Uh, this is some work done largely by Mike White's group at Texas, making this oxymetallocycle on a platinum surface from T-butyl nitrite. Uh, they did the experiment, and we did the, the calculations, uh, basically, to demonstrate that we got the same kind of agreement between experiment and theory. So here's an, an example of a stable oxymetallocycle on platinum. So four years ago, there was no proof that these species even existed. And now the numbers of them that we're seeing, uh, I think, will, will continue to, to increase. So let me conclude. I think oxymetallocycles represent a, a new class of observable surface intermediates. Uh, I hope I've shown you how the combination of, of theory and experiment has really been critical to uh, understanding how to make these species and what they are when we made them. I hope I've shown you from the isotopic uh, or kinetic isotope effect experiments how we can make some pretty direct connections between these single crystal experiments and the things that we observe in steady state catalytic reactions. And in fact, that we now have evidence for some of those proposed stable intermediates and in some of the, the complex reaction networks that have been proposed for this kind of catalysis in the past. And I think one of the other important 
aspects here, again, is the, the critical role of theory, not just in interpreting our experiments, but helping to tell us what experiments to do, helping to show us where to find that ring opening reaction of, of ethylene oxide. Well, what are the, the challenges and the, and the broader lessons? Think, we still don't understand a lot of this stuff. Why does a five-membered ring not close to make a three-membered epoxide, but the four-membered ring does? What is it about surface structure that leads to one or the other of those two in the course of, of steady-state olefin epoxidation catalysis? What are the promoters doing? Are the promoters helping the surface to choose whether you make four-membered rings that go on to epoxides or five-membered oxymetallocycles that, that go to something else. I think we have an opportunity from this basis to begin to understand the roles of surface structure and promoter effects, not just phenomenologically, but really with molecular level detail. So the question that I would like all of you to leave with today, question rather than answer, is what can we do? Uh, what new catalysis can we do with oxymetallocycles? And really, that can be a blend with any intermediates that we're waiting to discover. I wouldn't propose to you that this is the only way to uh, invent new catalysts and catalytic processes. I would suggest that this is uh, a relatively unexplored way to look for some entirely new chemistry on surfaces. And I would certainly contend that if we're going to follow the kind of path that I've shown you today, the combination of theory and experiment, uh, and the close coupling of those surface science observations with steady state catalysis experiments.